Well, hello everyone. So, um, as the only invertebrate speaker today, um, you're going to hear about some good as I have a backbone. Um, how did I get involved in spiders? It started in second grade, show and tell. Everybody I knew was bringing in hamsters and all these other things, and I had these spiders in the yard that built webs and bushes near the front door, and I would sweep the porch every day, and every day I'd come out, there'd be a fresh weather, and I thought, gee, these are really tough critters, right? So, in any case, uh, that led to this career studying spiders. I first stepped foot on Catalina when I was in college at Loyola Marymount University, right? And I then went on later to do an um, honors thesis on this particular spider, right? The genetic study long ago. And I came back to do a much bigger study as we're going to talk about today. So in any case, uh, we're also, we, we do a lot of different things in the spider lab at LMU. We just finished a two-year post-fire study based on that fire at two harbors that happened, okay? We're also writing up a paper based on heavy metal accumulation of a garden spiders at a little harbor versus a comparison site near the I-5 freeway in San Diego. So, in any case, if you want to know more about that stuff, I can talk about it later. So, all right. In any case, um, these cool creatures, these trapdoor spiders, very large. Okay, tarantulas and trapdoor spiders. Remember, these are the ancient kind of spiders. These spiders live decades, right? This critter has a lifespan estimated of 20 years or more. Okay. Remember, tarantulas have been recorded to live up to 40 years in captivity, right? So you really don't know how often they actually reach those elderly ages because they have parasites and so forth in the wild. But in any case, these kind of spiders are fundamentally different than your normal modern spiders who live maybe a year, right? So they used to have a very different game plan for how they make it through the world. So in any case, let's proceed on and tell you about this thing. So let's see. All right. Now, most of this data is going to come out of this paper that just came out earlier this year in the British Arachnological Society, which has changed their name to Arachnology here. And that's an adult male of Bothyocertum, so we got a cover uh, picture in this journal, which is really cool. Now, this particular animal, you're going to see a color photo of later on at the end of the talk, and that's actually going to be pretty significant for something that should be done in the future. In any case, let's proceed on and tell you about its life. So, as, as you may know from videos and so forth, these spiders construct burrows in the ground and they put a cork-like door on top of it, <coughs> which you can see here. If you walk around in the wild with a little nail or something, this is in this case, this is a dental tool, as soon as you find a half-moon shaped door, just reach down with your dental tool, lift up, and you've got something there. And there may be somebody on the other side having tug-of-war with you, but doesn't want you to open that, right? So that's pretty common as well, right? The game plan here is to basically sit quietly and let insects walk by, and when that poor little insect wanders by just doing its business through the neighborhood, all of a sudden the door pops open, the spider comes out, and, oh, death, right? So the spider, you know, take it down. And the door is open just for a few seconds, and then boom, it's gone. It's like, well, I thought there was a bug there. Yeah, there was. You know, right? okay. So in any case, you've seen these in videos, go on YouTube, there's loads of images like this. All right. Now, let's tell you some details about sort of their lifestyle. As if you think of their story, the cycle of nature happens. Baby spiders are born. They live in the maternal burrow, uh, typically for several months until they disperse and build their own burrows nearby. Once they set up their own burrow, it'll be very small. They will never move again. These animals will stay in the same place their whole life. If you have a female who lives two decades, she'll live in the same spot for two decades, right? Okay. So as you see here, males and females mature in this sort of age range, and the lifespan of 20 years or more is really attained by females. Males basically at some point, as it says down here, males leave and wander to find mates. They're basically mating machines. They'll just mate until they fall apart. They're never in a burrow anymore. You see them missing legs. I mean, they're just like a poor guy, and they're living kind of where they can under grass, and they're being picked off by bugs or whatever, right? So that they're just fall apart at some point, right? So it's the females that are really hitting the, the really long lifespans. So in any case, here's a picture of a male. Oops. Here's a picture of a male, as you can see here, looking around for a female. Here's a burrow that's closed. His game plan is to basically go up to one of these doors and start tapping and scratching, and then there'll be vibrations coming back, and she's interested, the door opens, and then, ah, stuff happens. Okay. And at some point, you have, as you see here, little babies parked around the inside. We've taken up to 400 babies inside a single burrow with a single mom, right? And they do this typically every other year. 
And so if a female hits adulthood in this size range and she lives till 20 years, think of how many hundreds or perhaps thousands of babies she'll produce in life. As far as we know, the survival of these things is very low. So this is one of those species that produces a lot of young, although only a small fraction will actually basically hit adulthood. So, all right, let's proceed onward. Now, one of the consequences of this sort of biology is these animals are typically found in clumps or clusters or aggregations. These are thought to be related individuals in the sense that the large burrows in the screen are probably matriarchs, moms, grandmas, and so forth. The younger ones are probably offspring related to the older ones, right? So you have this idea that you're going to have relatedness happening in these clumps of burrows where you find them, right? Now, in any case, here are some implications about this biology that we've talked about. First of all, as I've said, spiders in these aggregations are probably closely related. One of the issues, though, is if adult males mate with siblings and other relatives in their natal area, you may in fact have inbreeding occurring. And you would therefore expect that genetic variability may be reduced with fewer heterozygotes than you would, you would have expected. All right? Then also, interpopulation gene flow is probably largely due to wandering males. Right? So barriers to such movement is probably a bad thing. Okay? Now obviously, to start new populations, you need more than males to go to a new location. Right? In the or normal order of events, it's really males that are keeping these populations connected genetically. So anything that reduces their ability to move around, probably not good. All right. Now, because of these issues implicit in their biology, that led us to what we call the trapdoor spider project, which had four goals, as you see. One was to determine patterns of genetic variation within and among populations, because it hadn't really been done before. All right. Then we wanted to detect cases of demographic instability, or bottlenecks in populations. And we'll show you how we did that as we go through here. We wanted to look also at levels of interpopulation differentiation. We wanted to find out to what degree these populations have a history of genetic connectedness or not. Right? And finally, in more recent work that actually happened after that paper came out earlier this year, we've gotten involved in the past year or so in, in trying to find out the extent to which females mate with multiple male partners. The reason that's going to matter is this is a way potentially to combat the effects of inbreeding. Right? All right, we'll see kind of how all this stuff works as we go through here. All right, so in any case, the game plan was to sample uh, these spiders on six mainland sites, three sites on Santa Cruz and Santa Catalina Islands. We have a map coming up to show you. How do you do this? You walk around, find the burrows visually, and then get down on your hands and knees and start digging these things out with shovels and dental tools. We'll see pictures of this shortly. Total sample size was six to 47 for each of the nine sites that were sampled for 275 spiders. This was the largest study ever done on this species. All right, so here's our sites. And again, the mainland sites, Ote Mesa, Canyon Country, South Pasadena, Webb School of California, which we'll have something to say about later on, Fullerton, San Joaquin Freshwater Marsh. On the island, you have Willows Anchorage or Willows Canyon on Santa Cruz Island on the south side. You have Little Harbor and you have Toy on in Catalina. Right. What does it look like to do this work? Well, you go outside, you get a tan and so forth because you're walking around these hillsides. So you simply walk around like Jasmine is doing here, and when you find one of those burrows as she has, you simply take your dental tool, stick it down, lift the burrow, and look inside with your flashlight. If there's someone looking back at you, you know if someone's home, right? Sometimes when you look in there, you have babies, right? And we're going to talk about collecting the babies for that multiple mating by females kind of stuff. We'll talk about that later on. For this study, mostly we left females with babies alone because we didn't want to impact these populations, right? Okay, which was good. All right, in any case, once you find one of these burrows, you then get down on your hands and knees, go to work, eventually have a spider you can take back to the lab. Right? Pretty basic stuff. All right, now we used alzheimer electrophoresis, a molecular marker, long used and tried and true. Okay, uh, we looked at, oops, we looked at Nine different genetic loci. Oops, sorry, I keep hitting that wrong one. Okay, let's move forward. Okay. The nice thing about this is these are codominant markers. They're really easy to get, and it's really good. It's very easy to train undergraduates to do this work because we have we don't have a graduate program in biology at Loyola Marymount. We just have undergraduates, so it's fairly easy for them to learn how to make alizyme gels and stain for alizyme loci, which is what you what you see here. All right. Now I'm gonna basically just breeze through a lot of this genetic stuff because this is a population genetics conference. You don't need to know all the weirdness that goes down in the weeds with this kind of stuff. I'm going to tell you basically what these things 
do for you when we actually show you the data and stuff. So in any case, most of these calculations were uh, done using Biosys 2, which is a standard program for population genetics analysis. This program bottleneck was used to test whether effective population size had been restricted in the recent past. In other words, this is a business of trying to find out in recent history did any of these populations go through a bottleneck, a time when very few individuals managed to survive for whatever reason, as the population was basically cut down in number. Right? And finally, we wanted to look at population differentiation. There's a whole lot of ways to do that. We used a, an estimator called FST, which has been used for decades, basically, right? Standard way of comparing things genetically. All right, so let's go and see what we found. All right, now there are two common measures for genetic diversity, and the two big ones are basically heterozygosity and polymorphism. What I have here is the mainland populations and island populations. What you're going to notice is if you look at the heterozygosity column, you notice the values are something like 10% overall average. Well, then you go down to the island populations, and you notice there's only six animals, by the way, taken from Little Harbor. So you really want to look at Santa Cruz Island and Toy Island, and you notice that those things, 0.8% heterozygosity, 1.8% heterozygosity, those things are much lower, obviously, than what you have going there, right? Polymorphism, the number of alleles you have, basically, or the number of loci you have that are actually variable, higher on the mainland, lower on the island. Right. Okay. This is not unusual. Many island populations, when they start out, lose variability, and you can certainly see that happening here with these things. All right. Now, how do we place this in some context? Well, let's go back to a review paper that I published a long time ago that actually looks at 30 non-social spiders or people that done genetic work that I had access to up to 1999 to see how these numbers play out. And what you find is this. If you have heterozygosity on the x-axis, you have polymorphism on the y-axis, you notice that these 30 non-social spiders actually represented a wide range of variability. There's a whole crowd up here that has heterozygosity of 10% or more. Then you've got a crowd down here that's, you know, much less than that. You've only got one thing kind of sitting in the middle. Well, you notice, here's your mainland trapdoor spiders parked up here well within this 10% or more range. And then you have Santa Cruz and Toyon that are down here in the 2% or less crowd, essentially, right? Because some of these are doing pretty well in terms of what you expect typical spiders or invertebrates to have, and these two, at least, are clearly not anywhere near that. But again, as I said, this is probably what happens when you invade an island and you lose variability, right? Yeah. All right. So, now, here's the business of bottleneck testing. Now, again, we don't need to worry about, as I said, the details of why this works. You just, I trust the people that produce this stuff that it actually works. You want to read the literature, people debate these things, and they come up with, here's what works. Okay, so the point is, this program, produced by somebody in France, Piri, called Bottleneck, what it does is it looks at the relationship of these two variables. The point is that after a bottleneck, this one is expected to differ from this one in the following way. This one is expected after a bottleneck to be greater than this one. So what this method does is basically calculates these values for any population data you get it, and then finds out whether there's a significant difference between one or the other. In cases when you have, for all the loci that you look at, where this is in fact statistically higher than that across the board, then it tells you, hello, you've had a bottleneck event happen, right? So notice, what you have here is the number of loci that were looked at, and in each case it tells you, it tallies how many of those loci in fact had this value greater than that one. Here it's two out of five, here it's three out of four, here it's two out of four. Well notice in Webb School of California, every single locus had that pattern, right? And that's why it tells you, oh look, you've actually statistically gone over the edge now. We have evidence here that, in fact, a bottleneck occurred. So remember, this is a genetic signature of an event that happened, apparently, in fairly recent time for this population. Right? As to why, the details of why it works, don't worry about that. Trust the people. All right, let's go on and tell you this one. Now, again, don't get hung up on these numbers. What you want to remember is this is a standard measure for population comparisons. And you do, you calculate this pairwise style. Okay. What I'm going to tell you, first of all, is that this says on top, many of these pairwise estimates are larger than overall estimates for many animal species. There are many vertebrates where whole species will never have anything near 0.79. This FST value can range from 0, which means two populations are totally genetically identical, to 1, which means they're totally different at every look as you look at it, right? Some of these values for these trapdoor spider comparisons are obviously getting way up there in the range of one, right? But the odd thing about this table, if you look at it, is notice 
The smallest value in the whole table is that between Santa Cruz and Toyon, which are in fact on different islands. So what's that about? Hmm. We'll talk about that shortly. Hang tight. Okay. Yeah, let's proceed on to the next one. All right. Now, as I said, that's really, to some extent, the date of the report in that 2013 paper. What we're going to hear about now is the stuff we've done more recently, which looks at whether females, in fact, mate with multiple male partners or not, which is obviously going to have some impact on whether you're going to go down the road towards inbreeding slowly or not at all. Right? Okay. So in any case, in this work, what we did is we went to a local park a few miles from LMU, Kenneth Hunt State Recreation Area. We collected six batches of female Bothyosura their mothers and the broods, right? And there are typically between 150 and up to 300 and something babies in those broods we brought back to lab. We then, for this summer, for four of those sets of mothers and 50 of their spiderlings, we genotyped them for this PGM locus. And as it says on the bottom, multiple paternity, which is going to be what's going to happen when a female is mated with multiple male partners, that's going to be indicated when genotype ratios are not consistent with single fatherhood. Now, what that means is shown as follows. So notice, here's a locus, just a hypothetical locus that has two alleles, A and B. All right? This is basic genetics you probably had in high school or college, perhaps. All right? Now remember, all we know is the mom's genotype is we collect her and genotype her. We know the genotypes of her kids. So notice, the kids turn out to be of two kinds. Some of them are AAs, some of them are ABs. And we know that mom is an AA. So the only single dad that could father those kids would be this presumed father who's in fact an AB. Well, if that's the case, you should have a 50-50 offspring ratio of these to these. Well, how do you apply this to the real world? Take a look at the bottom. Here's data for another spider we've worked up in our lab, not these trapdoor spiders, and it's exactly the same thing. The mother for these babies over here was an AA, and the babies were of two kinds, AA and AB, and therefore the presumed dad should be an AB just like you had up here. So with 60 babies that were typed, you should have had a 30-30 ratio. But instead what you saw was 53 and 7. Which tells you she clearly made it with an AB individual, which is how you got those seven produced. But then you, pretty have, you have really good suspicion here that the second male was in fact an AA, which is why you're skewed in terms of so many babies of this kind. Right? Like I said, that's the rationale. All right. What does this look like for our data for trapdoor spiders? It looks like this. Here's the four that we typed in the summer. And remember, on the bottom, it's going to show you the predicted ratio. And on the top, it's going to show you what we actually saw. And notice, in all cases, these top numbers do not match the bottom ones, at least for the bottoms that are boxed up in red. Right? And in each case that the numbers don't match up, we have a chi-square test here that tells you, yes, statistically, these observes do not match the predicted. Right? So we looked at four, three of the four, 75%, show you evidence that she cleared these females at least made it with multiple male partners, right? So pretty cool. So what does this mean for these critters? All right, overall findings. First of all, these populations are usually as genetic variable, as usually as genetic variable as other invertebrates, which is probably good for them in terms of dealing with evolutionary challenges that are out there in the world, okay? The fact that females commonly mate with multiple male partners is probably going to ensure genetically variable broods. Probably the reason why you don't see genetic variability levels being lower for these things is because these females are practicing this game plan. Whoever shows up, they're going to do it with them, basically, as far as we know. Right? And obviously this may contribute to the maintenance of normal levels of variability. Now, on the flip side, on the other hand, keep in mind, those two po island populations that had good samples showed reduced variability compared to mainland populations. And that's probably due to this business, this phrase you've heard, of the founder effect. Where there's no way that a small group of founders can represent the whole array of genetic diversity that the source population has. And that's probably why our island populations show you that reduction, right? More generally, as we saw, bottlenecks are a possibility, as we saw with Webb School of California, right? And these populations are usually genetically isolated. They probably don't have a chance to exchange much, uh, given the landscape that they're in. This means that if extinction occurs anywhere, recolonization will be a challenge, given the lack of ballooning ability by spiderlings. Now, do you all remember Charlotte's Web? Remember the Disney video of Charlotte's Web? Remember how there's little babies at the end that are flying off into the sky, right? And everybody's like teary, a little kid's watching it, or all teary, they're both babies and stuff. Well, that's in fact the normal mode of aerial dispersal by baby spiders. Most spiders in the world do that. 
these baby spiders are too fat. They will not get airborne, right? Okay? And it's fairly common. Trapdoor spiders and tarantulas usually have chunky babies, and sorry, they're not going to get airborne. No, you're too heavy, all right? Which means the only way to get around is by crawling, right? So the point is that they're in a landscape where they're kind of isolated, and they don't have the aerial dispersal option, right? That's going to put them in some difficulties, right? All right. So in any case, to foster preservation of this gene pool, we should probably try to manage these populations by focusing on keeping as many around as you have, where they are, while also trying to build connections between them, while also creating a restoring habitat for potential colonization.